Let's put our hands together and I'll introduce our panelists for the day. Uh, first, Laura Daniel. <laughs> Laura is the uh, course director of typography and page layout in the DAD program. I'm sure a lot of our students are out there. Can I have a seat? Um, Nate Howe. Come on up, Nate. Nate is creative director and partner at Nathaniel James. He was a 2014 Hall of Fame inductee and a former Full Sail student, obviously. Nate. And Risa Nicholson, the longest title on here. Um, Risa was a uh, freelance TV producer unscripted TV producer for 20 years, and we're lucky enough also to have her as a full sail um, team member in the career development. career development department, which is very cool. So have a seat. <laughs> um, I'll stand for a minute and then um, I'll sit down and we'll get started. But. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have already freelanced uh, to some degree. I'm, I would imagine everybody in this room, every Full sale graduate will at some point in their career do some freelance, whether it's just a small project for a friend or relative, or you might have an entire career in freelancing. So um, at, as uh, Katie said, we're gonna have a question and answer at the end, so uh, get lots of questions ready. So I'm gonna start it out with a question that a lot of our Full sale students might be asked either now while you're a student or shortly after your graduation. I'll start with Laura. Answer this question in one or two words. Oh. Two words or less. Hey kid, would you do this project for free? It'll probably look really good in your portfolio and it might lead to more work down the road. Do I like them? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two words? Probably not. Probably not, you wanna expand on that? Well, unless I know them and it's something that we're doing collaboratively as a team that could, we could both benefit from, I, I, I'm not sure I would do anything that's just for my portfolio. And that might be where I am in my career, but I would say no. And because they're just looking to get a free ride, yeah. probably. Amen. <laughs> any any uh, thoughts? No, I agree. You know, I think that uh, you got to you know, as a freelancer, what you charge and the way you value your creativity is uh, part of your brand story. Mm. You know, having said that, I think there's a time for the slang that we say in my business, uh, one for the meal or one for the real. And sometimes maybe you make a little less, but uh, it's a beautiful campaign with somebody you want to network with. And so that one's for your real. Other times you get paid nicely and, you know, that one's for the meal, so. Yeah. Oh boy, I'm gonna be unpopular. Um, I would say, depending on where I was in my career, it sounds like a, someone coming out of school. I would imagine, well, that's what applies to these guys. So. Okay, I'm sorry? That's what, that's what applies to, to Exactly, folks. I would say if it's for a few days, sure, because anyone you meet is gonna be potentially someone who's gonna hire you down the road. It's an opportunity to put it on your resume, and as long as you're not giving up months and months of free time, you're gonna get a chance to um, to make contacts for your future. We just ran something on campus where I had 25 student volunteers. They didn't get paid, but I guarantee you they walked away with a great bit for their resume and some amazing contacts for their future. Good answer. Either way, you have to watch out for those Gotta people that are gonna ask that. Some of them are legitimate. You know, when you think about it, any real legitimate company might not even uh, pose that question to you. Yeah. Similar topic. What are your thoughts on doing work on spec? Uh, that, that's uh, speculation for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with the term. Somebody asks you to do a job and basically spec means you'll get paid if I can sell the thing. Well, you know, in my business, that's the nature of my business. I own an animation studio. We do motion graphics and television design. And, you know, a lot of the campaigns that we work on, we have to pitch for it. So, um, you know, that doesn't necessarily apply uh, to an individual or a freelancer right out of school. But a lot of times spec and free work is very similar. Uh, a lot of times people will dangle a carrot. I think the balancing act here is, you know, when you first graduate, you want to come across as eager and wanting to participate, but you have to balance that with not being taken advantage of. So I think that's just where you have to use your best judgment. I think judgment is a big thing there because you have to judge whether that 
that person is honest and um, it's a viable opportunity or if they're just trying to get something. Yeah. You have to remember, too, where you are. You know, if you're just graduating, it, you know, I think the danger is if, if you just take a black and white statement like never do spec work or never work for free, you know, you may turn something down that could lead to something beautiful. So it, there's really a lot of gray area in there, and you have to use your best judgment. You know, you have to realize that you're just getting out of school, and if it's an important contact that's not trying to, you know, like just squeeze you and exploit you, if it's somebody that you know could get help you get your foot in the door somewhere, then it might make sense. You know, it, it, it'll vary for each one of you. I agree with both of them, and it really is about judgment, and it really is about experience. And while you might have to do it more often in the beginning, where you are open to those opportunities because you never know where it's going to lead you, do use your judgment if you feel like you're being taken advantage of after a longer period of time. All right. Good points. You know, I read on an uh, industry blog the other day that uh, freelancers should charge at least two and a half times per hour what they would ha be happy making in a full-time job, and in some industries, up to four times as much. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's really unique to where you're working in the country or in the world. I think it's unique to the industry that you're on. Uh, there's some industries where people make a lot more money than others. Uh, some parts of the world, uh, certain studios are gonna be more willing to pay. I don't think there's a real uh, answer that I could give that, that says there's a yes no formula to what to charge uh i see people that do like logo design uh that have like a illustration agent that you know uh one guy we spoke to in los angeles he wanted uh thirty five thousand dollars per logo option you know other other guys that we hire you know we'll, we'll book them for five six hundred dollars a day and we'll expect them to make 10 15 options in that day for that rate so i think it fluctuates wildly based on your experience and the kind of niche market that you're in. I was going to say, I totally agree, based on your experience. And there is truth to that as you continue and you become more experienced, this won't apply right out of college. But um, when you become more experienced, you aren't getting health insurance. You aren't getting the benefits of a full-time job. So you do have to have a higher rate when you're actually getting, say, a weekly rate and you're being put on a gig for a longer period of time. If it's a day job or a two-day job, you can't really ask for that much more. But if you're being put on something freelance, they absolutely should bump up the rate a little because they don't have to pay extra for you. Yeah. And one thing just, uh, I know you may get into this but something that you guys really need to make sure you remember when you start freelancing if you do it consistently is your your taxes are not being taken out of that check so uh you know you get that first gig and you start thinking uh oh wow i'm making all this money at the end of the year you're gonna owe a lot of it back to the government so my first year freelancing leaving a full-time job that i got a placement I started making what i would make in a week in a day and i thought i was rich you know at the end of the year <laughs> you see how much you have to give back. So uh, you really have to, when you freelance, it's like you're running a little one person company. So you gotta make sure you handle your invoicing and your taxes and you handle your business and your brand appropriately. And, and uh, that's all you have when you freelance. I kind of want to address a little different note on that. You have to remember when you're freelancing, for, for me, I would be going up against smaller agencies or boutique agencies. And when they give a price, they're going to be charging for the building. They're going to be charging for the administrative staff. They're going to be charging for bookkeeping and those types of things. So even though I'm charging enough to cover what I need to at the beginning, I'm still going to be charging less than they are. So it's still got a real good value to it. So yeah, I, and that just depends on where you're and working. And it depends on what you're yeah. doing and where you're working. But it's something to remember. So if you feel like charging that much is like, oh, that's crazy, it's really not because it's still less than what the agency is going to charge. And, and in my world, you know, one of the things would be you wouldn't be necessarily a freelancer in motion graphics industry in Los Angeles wouldn't be necessarily competing with, you know, a, a studio. They would just be competing with other freelancers. So your rates would have to be in line. So it's really about the nuance of what industry and where and, and mm -hmm. what you're doing. I was gonna say, cause my experience very different from theirs comes from television production and this unscripted reality world talk shows. And those have become freelance jobs. They're, they're gigs and my gigs might be a little bit different. So often if I'm put on a job for three months or if I had been on something that was a little more extensive, I'm actually put on a W-2 form. So they are taking taxes out of my check as a producer and or associate producer 
producer or production assistant, if you're on a project that lasts long enough in television, yeah. you will actually have your taxes taken out. When you get to a certain level, and I know we may come to this later, you can choose to become incorporated if you're at like an executive producer level or a high level, and then you won't have any taxes taken out, and it's a different lifestyle to right. think about. Um, yeah. And it just gets a little complicated. It's so case by case, industry by industry. Absolutely. And one thing, you know, to back up on, uh, you know, the, the details of how you do the deal or your taxes or the money or whatever, uh, that's going to vary. But the one thing that I think would probably be true across the board is when you're hired as a freelancer, you're expected to come in and perform and deliver, mm -hmm. and more so than somebody that's getting their first job as a full-time employee. So when you first graduate out of school, I think it's uh, almost, at least for motion graphics in my industry I can only speak to, uh, it can be dangerous to go freelance too soon if you don't have your reel or portfolio at a professional level uh, or if you don't know how to go in and be a hired gun and just handle the pressure and deliver on the deadline with quality, uh, you can hurt your reputation. So a, a great path for people wanting to get into motion graphics or 3D animation and, and work in that type of business is to get a you know one, two year full time gig, work on your portfolio and your skills and then take that freelance leap when you're ready to really be out there defining your brand. Because uh, every time you take a gig, you're only as good as how you uh, finish that up. You know, you could do 10 great gigs, and on the 11th, you drop the ball, and that producer, it's a small industry, they're not gonna hire you again. And they splinter off, they get a different job, then they tell the creative director there, hey, don't hire that artist because they're flaky. So you don't wanna go out there and start freelancing and defining your brand to the industry until you're ready to crush it. Because when I hire freelancers, I need them to come in and just be like <coughs> dialed in and ready to go. Good point. Great. What was the question again? <laughs> um, well, let's stay on the, on, the, on the money topic for a second. How would you recommend uh, these men and women to um, establish their hourly rate? I mean, every different uh, part of the country has got a different hourly rate for freelancers, whether it's graphic design or motion graphics, as Nate uh, mentioned. I'll make it a two-part question. And or do you find it better or easier to charge by the project? Give them one price for the project, or do you say, I'm going to charge you hourly until it's done, and how do you establish that rate? Well, I'll, t I'll tell you how I establish what I'm going to charge for a project. I decide what I'd like to make per hour, and then I figure out how many hours it's going to take. Then I figure in changes, and of course, I write that into the proposal about how many changes it could go through and how many iterations it could go through while, without incurring more charges. But I, I, that's how I kind of figure how out you, what my hourly rate, it, rate is. How do you find that number, that hourly rate? If you're in Manhattan, it's going to be different than if you're in Poughkeepsie. I guess mine has just kind of been established since I've been doing this. It's I, I worked for companies and I knew what they were charging for hourly rates for the employees that worked there, so I based my hourly rate on the hourly rates that these companies were charging. Right. And I understand that the back of the uh, Graphic Artist Guild guide on ethical guidelines has some... It does have some rates in there. In this, in Central Florida, they seem to be a bit high. They might be more LA, New York. I'm not sure. I'm going to go with those guys on that. Yeah, you know, in my experience, uh, the best way to kind of get information, it, it's so dependent on where you end up freelancing and what you know, where you work. If you're working in motion graphics or if you're working at Sony as a freelance visual effects guy, if you're working at a game studio or in television, it's going to be different. Uh, my best advice in the way that I found out how to do it was I was just friends with a lot of people that I graduated with and they were getting gigs at places I wanted to work at and we all talked and we helped each other. Uh, I think one of the best things you can do while you're here at school is get out of your own little bubble of just your degree program and go meet somebody in a different degree program. Uh, the guy who's presenting me in the Hall of Fame on this trip, he was in digital media, I was in computer animation, he became one of my best friends. He helped me get my first freelance booking. I asked him, what should I charge? He goes, well, I noticed uh, a lot of artists are getting around this rate, maybe ask for that. And he helped me figure that out. So, uh, you know, lean on your network that you have here as well to help you. 
completely. And I would say again, industry dependent, just as they're both saying, we never, I never thought in hours in my world, it was a day rate or a weekly rate. A day rate versus a <laughs> weekly rate. A day rate versus weekly. And I never even thought of it in an hourly. Yeah. And I always play the game with them. They'd say, so what do you, what do you charge? I'd say, what have you got? Oh. So let them <laughs> tell you first. So see if you can get them. And they say, well, what do you usually get? I say, you let me know what you've got. And if they, it's really just a game of wits or, yeah. and, and you try to give them, get them to give you a number because if it's, you have a number in your head, but if it's way lower than what you were thinking and you know you can afford to say no, then you say, oh, wow, that's way low. Yep. Sorry, guys, I can't do that. I was thinking more X. And then you raise it at least, in my world, $200 more a day or a week, you know, or 100 more a day that you want to make. I, I think I work in more days. You guys are on projects. So it's... Uh, and then you try, because you know they're going to come back down again. So it's truly a game, and it becomes a gift of negotiation. And kind it's super dance. awkward at first, but uh, always try to get them to give you a number first. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. you know, and be careful if you go hourly versus day, because think about what that's going to do for you. Like before thinking with it, let's say you're working with a client that is really cautious about how much money they're going to spend. And let's say it's your first freelance gig. So maybe you're not as fast as you're going to be yet. So then you get yourself on an hourly program where you're getting paid by the hour. Now your client is stressing out about how long something's taking. That's putting more pressure on you to do it faster. And that's a lose-lose. So uh, when you're thinking of how to structure the deal, try and think through from the client's perspective or from the company's perspective and from your own what would make sense for you. Right. Good point. Um, when you guys started freelancing, did any of you have a business plan? Or did it just kind of fall together? Can I go first? Sure. Yeah. Okay, I never intended to be a freelancer. <laughs> I'm just going to say that blanket. I graduated from college. I wanted to be a talk show producer. I started down that path. It was really a big deal in the 90s. There were a lot of talk shows before cable exploded. Yes, I'm old. And, um, and it was great. And I was, th thank you for someone who else is old. <laughs> um, and so I loved it. And these shows could last. The problem is you're only as good as the show you're on in my world. So I'm so sorry. <laughs> and so if the show doesn't work, but you're an awesome producer, there's no more jobs. So your show gets canceled, you have to move on. Panicked me. I never expected that. I was my first year, I had a PA job on a talk show, and the show got canceled. And I was like, what? I have to find another job? That's crazy. So then I started continuing on talk shows. When I moved, when cable got bigger, and there were all these shows and shows and shows, which also created more projects for guys like you, there was so much more to choose from, and freelance just became the nature of the business. And that's what I. That's when I became a freelancer. So I didn't just intend to be one. It's just the way it became, and it was production companies would hire teams that they needed for that project. Project. Uh, mine may have been like big, huge TV show projects versus just creating something for that project. And so you would be put on staff for three or four months and you would know at the end of those you're going to have another job or you have to find another job. It's a lot of hustle. So freelance found me. It stressed me out in the beginning, super, super stressed. I got really comfortable with it as I established myself in the business, as I had more contacts. And I was able to know that even though it was nerve wracking not to have a job for six weeks and then enjoyable during that time, by the end of the year, I knew I'd make enough to get me to what I needed for that year. But it's super, super stressful until you feel a little more established. But it will work out. I'm, I'm going to go next because I think when I started, because I'm, I'm old too. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I actually had a BFA in studio painting, which was very different. I started in trying to go the fine arts realm. And I worked at the museum. And I saw what they were getting for communication, graphic design, and that type of thing. And I was like... I was like, oh, that's really interesting. I think I could do that. So I tried my hand on it, started at a classic Mac, and I know I'm showing my age there. But um, I just kind of fell into it, worked in entertainment design, and then realized that I could do this on my own and it would be more profitable. So that's kind of how I fell into it. Yeah, for me, you know, I started out as a student here wanting to work in film visual effects. Uh, I wanted to do match moving and, and compositing. Uh, when I met my buddy in uh, uh, the digital media program, I started really getting interested in motion graphics and design. Uh, I found that the industry of filmmaking, uh, you work, you know, maybe for a year on a project and you're only really touching one shot. And your creative voice and expression on that, unless you're a very high level person, is extremely limited. You're just kind of executing somebody else's vision. So I discovered motion graphics where you could uh, be in charge of the look of the whole campaign and do the lighting, the camera moves, the sound, the flow, the edit. So I fell in love with that, got a full-time gig. Uh, I got a few kind of requests about the freelance world from Los Angeles. 
it was very scary for me because, you know, to move to the most expensive, one of the most expensive markets in the country and not have a full-time job, being a, you know, a kid right out of school seemed irresponsible. My parents didn't like the idea. It was a stressful, you know, thing to take on. What I found is actually freelancing in that market living there gave me more job stability and security because there's so many studios out there. There's so much work. You know, whenever I come back and I speak to the 3D animation students, they don't realize how much work there is in motion graphics. So that freelance world allowed me to uh, just work on a really diverse array of projects and meet so many people. And, uh, you know, I was really grateful I took that path. It was more stable. That's great. Good, good, good. Um, you know, uh, uh, Nate, you mentioned the whole income tax thing a few minutes ago, and I hate to bring everybody down with income tax, but how would you, what would you recommend and how would you advise these people to, to deal with it? I mean, because it's, it's the it's, nightmare uh, it's of a the It's a pain. Business. Yeah, I mean, you know, you have to really be careful. Uh, I think what you do is every time you get a check, you just take like 20, 30% out of it and put it in an account and forget that you have it. And then at the end of the year, you'll be grateful you did that. You also have to make sure in the market you're working in that you're kind of following the code. Like in Los Angeles, they have the Los Angeles city business tax. Yes. And that they're like the mafia. They like go after people. <laughs> That's true. And, and the thing is, is unless you make more than uh, $300,000 a year, you're exempt from it. But if you don't file your exemption status, then the exemption gets canceled and you get a penalized and you have to pay thousands of dollars more. to them and you have to do it by a certain date. So there's all kinds of things that you need to know and they're market dependent. You know, my studio is in Beverly Hills and we have to pay the city of Beverly Hills uh, a city tax to have the office there. And then we have to pay Los Angeles a different thing. So when you freelance out there, uh, you know, there's a lot of things you have to keep in mind. It, it's really the not fun part of the business, but uh, if you don't handle it, it will definitely handle you, you know, cause they'll, they'll get it one way or another. But That's the fun a good, part of it is that you point. can deduct anything entertainment related when you do that, right? You can, your movies, your magazines, anything that kind of tips you into the industry, even your cable at home, certain sure. things can go as business expenses because your business is entertainment. So even though the things you're doing for free are actually educating you for the industry. So. But save your receipts. <laughs> save yeah. everything because if... If they come to audit you, you have to have all that information to show them yeah. that, that what is actually what you did. So the, the key so. is pay it when you get it. And uh, just remember that you can do it one or two ways. You can send it in or they'll come get it from you. Right. <laughs> it's better to send it in. Uh, right. Uh, so uh, I know this sounds like all business stuff, but yeah, it's a small business. Uh, LLC versus sole proprietorship versus a corporation. LLC is a limited liability, uh, liability corporation. Sole proprietor is you working at home in your pajamas, and a corporation is a corporation. You can do it any of the three ways, and what's everybody's experience? You could be a corporation working at home in your pajamas, too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Technically. I think, I think uh, incorporating is the best bet, yes. uh, because, I mean, it costs a little bit more up front, but you'll get tax benefits. I, you know, I'm not a tax expert. I have people that handle all that for me, so <laughs> right. I, can't, I can't go much further on that, but I do know in certain studios in Los Angeles, uh, you have to incorporate to work with them um, just because of some complex tax things that are going on out there. Right. And really it's better to incorporate because then you're not using your social security number on every piece of information that you're giving all your different clients because they're going to need to send in the information that they spent this money on you because they get a tax break for that. So they're going to be sending this in and they'll have all of your information. It's much better to have an ID than use your social security number. And, so, and you're yeah. less likely to be audited if, if you're just an individual, uh -huh. you know, if you run it as a company and then you pay yourself a salary through that, then, it, you know. And tell me, and being incorporated is what a lot of TV producers who work in the unscripted world do when they get to a certain higher level, because you also can get health insurance through that corporation, correct? Oh, yeah. Right, because otherwise, you know, that's something you're going to have to look into is health insurance, because nobody else is providing it for you. So becoming incorporated does cost more up front, but pays off in the long run if you're making a certain amount of money. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I would wait to do it. Good deal. So the LLC and a corporation will provide you with a tax ID number that's yes. not your social security number, Correct. so that your social isn't floating around with a million different people. True. Right. Which wasn't a problem 10 years ago, but it, it certainly is now. <laughs> um, work for hire versus contract work. Work for hire meaning they own the work and everything that you do. Contract work means you retain some or all the ownership of it. Everything's work for hire in my world. Uh, I think 
you know, if you're doing something where people are going to pay you considerable amount of money, unless it's a script that you've generated and something that you really have some ownership over, a lot of times you're not going to retain the rights to it, um, you know, so uh, at least in the motion graphics industry. So it's not an issue. Right. Yeah, there's no option the other way. Yeah. I don't think it's an issue in my graphics communication, graphics design either, but I do think in illustration that that does come up a lot. Yes. Yeah. And um, I'm going to throw this out there. Kenny, why don't you... Well, I'm, I'm an illustrator by trade, and it, same, same thing goes with photographers. You'll get, a lot of times you'll have the option, doing work for hire, which means you, it's a total copyright transfer. They own it. They can put, do anything that they want with it. Or it's contract work where you own it. If they want to use it again, they pay again. Yeah. I mean, and to give perspective from my standpoint, like, you know, let's say HBO calls my studio to do some graphics uh, for Game of Thrones, and we do some title work for it, right? Or we do some uh, promo work. Well, HBO, already in the contract that we have to sign, they own everything that we do. So then if we hire one of you guys to work on it, we, we can't own what you guys did. You can't own it because they already own it. So uh, there's, right. for us, it's a non-negotiable thing because that's how HBO chooses to work with us. Same thing. Read what you're given. There's always going to be a deal memo or some sort of contract, and you want to make sure because I also agree it's work for hire, not likely to own it unless it's something very specific as they're talking about. And same thing with your creative ideas. If you're a TV producer or you're working on something and you're working under a company, if you're creating something during that time, it has to be spelled out that that is not going to be, that is yours. So you need to make sure that deal memo or contract states any other creative process that I have outside of this, especially if you're free freelancing is your own so somebody doesn't try to say well you created that when you were sitting in our offices and that they own it so just read the fine print and then feel free to negotiate if it's something that's a short-term gig that you can then not let it affect your other projects great points um what kind of sales and marketing efforts did you guys do or do you continue to do to generate more work or and specifically more freelance work. I know uh, yeah. Nate, you don't do freelance work anymore, but I'm sure at some point you marketed yourself somehow. Yeah, absolutely. It's critical because when you're competing, you know, let's say you're going to be a freelance uh, animator or designer in Los Angeles, uh, you're going up against a ton of people out there. So you got to get your name out there. You got to, you know, when I, when I first started freelancing a few years after graduation, I started thinking, okay, you know, other artists are going to be looking at whatever form online, but where's like a studio owner or where's like a producer or a coordinator going to be looking? They're not going to be reading necessarily that industry form. Where would they look to find me? What kind of keywords would they be typing in if I was trying to hire an artist to do what I want to do? What would they be searching? Maybe they're not as connected and know exactly the cool forms that you guys know. They would probably Google it or think about it a different way. So I did all my SEO to kind of link me in to really kind of uh, uh, almost generic statements of like freelance animator, Los Angeles, uh, you know, on-site designer, Los Angeles. And I just connected myself with a lot of keywords that somebody who would be searching for candidates would think to use. Um, aside from that, you know, your portfolio is your advertisement. Uh, at least in, in, in my world, it's all about what you create. So always keeping that fresh and having that up to date, always having some business cards on you, like keeping your personal brand intact, so critical to being a freelancer. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just key. I think, yeah, keeping your personal brand and business cards and having them on you because you're going to meet people at the grocery store. You're going to meet people, you're going to run into somebody you know, and they're going to say, oh, what do you do now? And you tell them, and they're like, wow, that's great. And you hand them a business card, right? So there's that connection, and they already have the information to get back in touch with you. It's, it's just be ready. I think most of my work comes from networking or from word of mouth, because if you're doing a good job for somebody, they're going to tell somebody else about it. And, and then you're, you're, they're going to hire you as well. I mean, my clients are small businesses, um, 10 to 15 employees, and they rely on me for in-house stuff. You know, if they're doing any advertising, I do that. There are websites, I do that. There are any kind of print material, I'm there for them. So, it, you know, when you get that word of mouth going then, and you've got loyalty with your clients and you have loyalty to them too, it, it really works out. I definitely say word of mouth is key, but in, in my world, it's who you know, which everybody hears mm -hmm. all the time, right? And frustrating if you don't know anyone. But also number two, that's just as important as how well they like you. Do they want to work with you? Do they want to deal with you? Every job you're on, and I think you said this earlier, you both probably said it, if, you're, if they're not enjoying their ex experience with you, that word's going to get out faster than how great you were. And besides just getting, giving 
giving them your business card, always get their card. Mm -hmm. I always say, put your taxi light on. It's kind of like dating. You got to let people know what you're looking for and who you are and what you're doing so that they can find you either through the internet or through word of mouth, through the grocery store. And everyone you meet, everyone here in, in, in your student body is potentially the person who's going to hire you. And then down the road, you may hire them. So make a lot of friends. It is networking, networking, networking. And I don't mean social networking because that's what he asked me earlier. It is truly about just meeting people, staying in touch. I don't live in Los Angeles anymore. I moved here a couple of years ago and I now work at Full Sail. Every once in a while, I'll make a call and be like, hey, I'm in Florida if you need anything. If you need somebody to go down to Miami, do you need somebody for that shoot? I'll just put it up there and email my friends. Just wanted to remind you I'm here if you need something. And I just stay in touch with executive producers I've worked with in the past, people who run companies. And every once in a while, I'll get a call. And then I will say, because I don't know if this will come up, there is in the world of my world, and I'd be curious if it's in yours, on Facebook, there are now these groups, and I've spread this word across campus as much as I can. I don't know if anyone's heard of them. They're called I Need A dot dot dot. Have you heard of these? No. no. Has anyone heard of these groups? Or have I told you if somebody's raising their hand? So this became something that came out of this Facebook generation and getting hired as, for freelance production because there are so many unscripted shows. There really, really are. This is very unscripted. There's one that's I need a production assistant. I need a producer. I need a casting director. I need a cameraman. I need an editor. I need a paid production assistant because people were feeling like there were volunteer opportunities. So go on Facebook today and look those up. Many of them are closed groups. Some are public. And then there are secret groups. You're going to love that. And that means you have to be invited by someone who's already in it because people are posting for jobs on there. And that is a way to get a gig. It's another way of networking. And oh. it is a way to, um, because I really feel mine is a little bit different than what you guys come from. So sure. I'm so sorry. But it is truly, it's not, there's no HR. There's no red tape. It's literally like, I've done it before. I've posted on there. Hey, I need a staff. I'm looking for an associate producer. I'm looking for a this. And then resumes flood in instantly so I recommend looking those up make sure you choose all posts on the notifications once you get in and uh, that's a really good networking tip using social media and you know I think one thing too is when when you're a student here and when you're getting ready to graduate and you're thinking about getting that first job uh, sometimes it's easy to have the mindset or well, let the employer come get me and tell me what I'm supposed to do and then help me get my job and, and tell me what I have to do and, and how do I get in there and what time do I come in. When you're a freelancer, the way to beat the herd and the way to beat like all the other people competing is to uh, uh, get out and do all those things for yourself. You have to have self-efficacy to, to be effective and what do I need to do to make more people aware of me? What do I need to do to get into that studio? without like coming across as like stalking them or creepy. How do I have to like keep my portfolio? How, how do I have to market it? Um, you have to be so proactive to f break into the freelance world. And I feel like sometimes as a student, it's easy to have this kind of sit back mindset of, well, you know, I'll, I'll meet with my placement advisor and hopefully I'll get a, a follow up you know, call. When you're a freelancer, you have to go out and hustle in every different area. It's not just like, I want to be a freelance animator, so let me only work on animation. It's, I have to work on, you know, my personal brand. I have to work on how I network. I have to work on my contacts. I got to make sure my billing's intact. I got to make sure that my invoices and my contracts make sense for what I'm doing. And so it's so much more work than you might imagine. And that's why, you know, right out of school, it's a tough thing to start right as a freelancer because you, you still have to learn how to uh, do what you're studying for pay anyway. That's already a new experience that creates new challenges. Uh, so rushing into freelancing too soon, uh, you know, can be, tr can be tricky. Um, you know, when it comes to keeping your work out there, and current, would you guys recommend a personal website or a blog or both or a combination of the two? I would recommend a combination of the two, mainly because if you, if you have your website and your portfolio on the website, plus you're contributing to the blog and you're bringing information to it, it's only going to work better for SEO, which is search engine optimization, and it's going to draw more hits towards you, so you're going to get more organic hits. You're going to have other people referring to your blog if you have inf interesting information up there, and they're going to repost information that you <coughs> post, so that's going to pull more people to your site as well. I, for me, you know, I really 
on a website that I get from somebody, I don't want to see like a blog of their cat photos or like what they're eating. You know, I want to see like the work that we're hiring them to do. So I always like the personal and lifestyle stuff to be separate from the work. As a freelancer, I think when in doubt, it's better to just be prof professional. And uh, you know, a great uh, businessman told me once, sell the currency they're buying. So uh, you know, speak in the language and show people uh, you know, what they're looking to hire, you know, just fulfill that need and make them aware that you do it. And that's how you get freelance gigs. So be careful not to have your personal stuff too intertwined with your professional world. Yeah, we call it digital hygiene. For those of you who have heard it here at Full Sail and Career Development, Google yourself and see what comes up. Just like he's talking about, Google your brand name, Google something. And besides using, I do think a personal website is good, especially to showcase your work. And you talked about yours having all those keywords. The other place you should have your uh, basically your working, breathing resume is LinkedIn. I mean, everyone should have a LinkedIn page because people are finding you that way. You can connect with anyone in the world. You, and that's what it is. It's professional. It's not about what you ate, what your yeah. cat did, anything like that. It's your living, breathing resume, 24 hours a day working for you. If you do have a design, you can put your designs in there. You can put your clips in there of things you've shot. You can put descriptions of your jobs. You have a nice professional picture of yourself and you can make a branding statement under your name that people can find you using those keywords. It doesn't have to say the name of your last job. That's a choice. So brand yourself. Choose the words that you want people to identify with you and identify yourself under LinkedIn. You're all welcome to link with me. I will absolutely say yes to you. And then you're now connected to all the people I know and potentially. And then you can, once they say yes to you via LinkedIn, be bold. Send an email if they do a job you've always been interested in and just say, I'm really impressed with your, your, uh, your LinkedIn profile. I'm graduating from college. I'd love to talk to you more about your experience. Could we have have an informational interview could I do a phone call with you you know maybe you can even tie it into a class project but LinkedIn is an amazing tool for beginning your networking now yeah. and I think bringing up LinkedIn is important because on LinkedIn you also have networks like AIGA and other groups that oh, yeah, will groups. post on there and you could join the groups on yes. there and then you can find out when they are having a networking session or they're yes. all getting together to you know celebrate yeah. something and find the and people I'm sorry find the people you like and you're impressed with their careers Mm -hmm. maybe it's Nate, and look at the groups he follows. Mm -hmm. And then follow those groups so that you know he's already connected in the world you want to be in and what interests him. So then you're following the right path of getting more information to put yourself out there. And at the end of the day, just remember what you're trying to get a job doing. I mean, like there's all these complex things we're talking about <laughs> with taxes and networking. At the end of the day, what is somebody going to hire you for? And make sure that you speak about that with passion, that you can articulate your creativity to somebody, that you know how to get people excited about your work and believe in you, uh, and, and that you know it's okay to be out of school and getting that first gig, and you don't have to know everything. You don't have to walk in a studio like you own the place and you, you could do it all, because you can't yet. So just own that, be accepting of it. You know, don't come in and bash yourself in the interview. Come in and talk about your strengths. Yeah. Own what you do. Speak about it with passion. Uh, speak up about what you want to have. You know, be a, a squeaky wheel and, and tell people what you want. And uh, do it confidently and just be where you are. And then get that first gig that will lead to the next one and the next one. So that, that's the secret. It's just there's no shortcut. It's all about what you're selling. And just articulate that to people in a way that gets them excited. I was going to say, I agree with everything he just said. And I got my first job in television because, and this was before the internet and all this great, wonderful stuff that you guys have. I got it because I made a connection. I don't even remember how. Sent my resume in via email. I mean, via long, regular mail. And the woman called me and she said she hired me because I was the most persistent person she'd ever met. And she just decided to give me a chance because I wouldn't leave her alone. I wasn't annoying. <laughs> I was politely persistent. I, I came out to Los Angeles. I interviewed with her. I paid for my own flight. No one's going to fly you out there. If you want to work in LA, and I know Nate's going to agree, you have to be there. Yes. You have to be there. You're not going to be there. I'm not coming if I get a yeah. job. If you want to work in Los Angeles, I will wave this flag. That, I you mean, that's have so critical. Yeah. It's critical. I mean, when, when I, I was in Charlotte, North Carolina, that's where placement got me my first gig. And I took it because uh, we talked about building my portfolio, my reel, to be stronger so I could go out into LA and New York markets, uh, skipping a few steps on the ladder. Uh, I sat down and I wrote 60 motion graphic studios in Los Angeles that I liked. You wrote I, them on a piece of paper. I, I, I had, no, I had an email. <laughs> oh, and yeah. I, had, I had emails written to them. And, uh, you know, on the resume that I worked with, uh, with Full Sail, on the top it had my address, you know, here in here. Florida. Yeah. And 
like a month later, I didn't hear back from any of them. And I was like crushed. I was like, oh man, like I felt like my work was getting better. How come none of these studios, not even one wrote me back and I was so upset about it. And uh, what I realized now that I own a company is there's an army of people waiting in Los Angeles to get a job. Why are we going to take a kid out of school who's, you know, doesn't have a lot of experience and fly him out here and put him up so he can work with us? It doesn't happen very often. I, I got out to LA. I went out there. I, re I wrote all of them again. And I said, hey, you know, I live here in Los Angeles now, still very interested in freelancing with you. And I heard back from like 40 of them yeah. a, in a month, like yeah. literally 40 of them. I worked for uh, eight years in Los Angeles without one day lapse in uh, not having a booking in the freelance world. It led me to Italy, uh, Germany, um, uh, all over the world freelancing New York. And it turned out to be a very rewarding career that helped me start my own studio. Um, and the key was just getting those first few bookings and being reliable. And being there. And, yeah. and I wouldn't be doing my current job if I didn't say it's now called career development. So what he keeps talking about is placement is career development. And we're over there Wednesdays, 11 to 2, open door, plug for career development. Yeah. <laughs> when, when I was a student here, you only had to meet with uh, placement one time was scheduled. <laughs> and I think I met with Christy Ansley in, in placement. Oh, yeah. I met with her like eight times. And I just kept calling her. I was like, hey, can we talk about my resume yep, more? Can we get this in. dialed in? And she always, you know, greeted me. So. Yeah, and if you're a within three months of graduation, you're assigned an advisor and you can make that appointment. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Laura, you mentioned AIGA a minute ago, which is um, an industry organization for graphic designers that we always recommend all of our graphic design and D&D students uh, to join before they graduate. Um, Nate and, and Risa, are there any industry organizations that are particular to your field that you would recommend somebody joining? Uh, it's, you know, uh, it's not really an organization, but I know a lot of my industry w uh, watches motionographer.com a lot. Uh, and you can kind of connect on there. There's job boards and, and inspiration on there. Um, to me, there's not really a form or a, a chapter that I'm tightly associated with. Promax BDA is a big conference. Uh, you know, all the big networks are there. Uh, so that's something that if you want to work in the television and marketing and, and that type of world, you could consider going to. Um. Okay. I think it's also important to note, I, I worked a lot in themed entertainment, meaning Disney and Universal and oh, the like, yes. but not the movies, I did the parks. And so, uh, there's some different groups, like I belong to one called Slice, where it's a bunch of people from that industry, and when there's jobs available, they post them there, and we have meetings where we go meet and socialize and network. And so if you like one particular area, be it motion or film or whatever, there are probably some networking groups where it's people that work in that industry that know each other, that have gotten together and help each other out. Yeah and get each other jobs. And I've gotten quite a few projects from it. So. I was gonna say, I know there's professional groups, I, none that I'm really a part of and other than joining like the Emmys organization, but if you're into music, I know one of our advisors talks about Grammys.org, has a student membership, which is either free or very inexpensive. And so if you're into music and, gram and working in the music business, there are chapters all over the country if you join that organization. So check it out on Grammys.org, and I know that that's pretty exciting for anyone who might be a music person. Okay, I'm, I'm told to start wrapping this up. So I've got five minutes, I'm gonna throw out one last question. Um, how do you deal with or handle a slow paying client? I think Nate, you mentioned this when we what? were in there. A slow paying client. A Ooh, slow, play a slow paying, paying client. Paying client. Oh. Well, it's a fine line between being yeah. rude and persistent oh. and <laughs> irritating. <laughs> I mean, sometimes, you know, with, with my world now, it's, you know, we bill 50% up front and we bill the rest on completion. As an individual freelancer, it's hard to do that. Uh, any big studio, you're going to be, you know, getting pretty regular pay once you're in the system. Uh, but sometimes people don't pay. You know, we had, uh, uh, we had a big project that we were about to get started on, and thank God, before we got involved, we found out the lady was uh, kind of shady, and she owed, like, uh, you know, a couple of people that worked with her, like, 50, 60,000 bucks to th four or five people, and they hadn't been paid in a year. And uh, right. when that happens to a company, you write it off as a loss and, and you move on. There's nothing you could do. It, it could be a lot more detrimental to, you know, an individual starting their career. So there's no real great way to deal with somebody if they don't pay uh, that I'm aware of. You know, I think the key is using your judgment before you get in bed to them, figuring out, like, how long is the song before you agree to dance? You know, that's what we, that's what we call it in our world is, you know, what's the schedule? What's the expectation? What's the deliverable? When do I get paid? hammering that out in the beginning before you commit 
because once you're in, then it's harder to negotiate and get it figured out. So, you know, I think you're, you're, the prep work is key to not getting screwed over later. And, and it's usually the very small clients that you have to uh, worry about. I've, I've always found that if yeah. I'm beginning a new relationship with a really large organization or corporation, first, the second phone call I make after being uh, given a freelance job is to accounts payable and ask them if there's anything I can do to make your life easier because you got to figure the people in accounts payable, they get nothing but nasty phone calls all day wait, from people saying, where's my money? So if you can make friends with them right away and make their life easier, they'll make your life easier. Um, okay, this time we have a few minutes for questions from our audience. Um, if you have a question, I want you to raise your hand. Also, for those of you who are joining us on, um, online, direct your questions to your online moderator who will try to accommodate any questions that you have. So we have a couple over here, over here. Mic check. Over here. Mic check. Mic check. Mic check. Check. Yeah. check. 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 That gentleman right there. There you go. Hi. Yes. My name is Nestor. Um, I like to know exactly all that information you actually said about the taxes and everything is. Where is that uh, dummy guide? Because I like I get lost when I'm trying to find out more about taxes and like there's so many good information that you just gave and I would like to really know like how can you find out, you know, besides hiring a professional like you did. It's just, but you know, for that's where I found out. I mean, that, you can oh, Google okay. it. There's a lot, I, I, you know, tax, tax stuff's not my uh, area of <laughs> expertise. Uh, I just pay somebody and they take care of it for me. And, well, and, you know, you, uh, I mean, you can, you can Google like it. But, yeah. You can probably Google it. I was going to say it's every state by state is different. Yeah. You could also, I think they do free consultations at an H&R block. If you don't go during tax season, okay. I'm pretty sure they would like something as simple as an H&R block, which wouldn't cost you a million dollars, you know, up front. But, um, there's the information is online somewhere, but I'm not a tax person either. Yeah. I'm sure you can find stuff it. on a, a government site as well yeah, that we talk to, and that would have all the. But make sure and everything. I mean, to me, the reason why I hire somebody to do it is because just like that creative thing that I told you about that LA city tax, if you get the letter from them or if you read the website, it's it's misleading and there's loopholes and there's things that apply to you and that they and they don't. And you could spend all day figuring that out or you could spend that time working on your portfolio and, and networking. So like to me, you know, taxes, they're important. You gotta save for them, you gotta be in line. But your real concern is let's get that first freelance gig. You know, worry about getting paid in your taxes once you're getting paid and, and have to owe taxes. You know, right now it's crush the portfolio, get out there, network and get that first gig. You know, that's, that's what matters A1. Let me, let me throw something out there. Uh, a good idea, I mean, this is hard for a freelancer that's just starting out. A good idea is to hire an accountant. They can be expensive. You can also go to eftps.gov, uh, which is a place where you can go to the IRS and send them money, and they love to take money. Um, e eftps.gov, you can sign up. You put in your social security. It's very secure. Put in your social security number. And if you get a check next week for three grand that you just did, for some, a job you just did for somebody, put that money in the bank, let it clear. As soon as it clears, you can go on to the EFTPS and send them $1,000 that day. And it'll tell you which, ask you which tax period, uh, uh, period's for. And they've got the money, and so you can't spend it. So it's it. like a prepay right there. Exactly. An accountant wouldn't advise you to do it that way, but at least it's out of your hands, and they've got it. With Uncle Sam, remember, yeah, no. Remember, yeah. If, you if, you, if, you, if, you're, if they're giving you start paperwork, or what they call it, or tax forms, they might be paying you on a W-2. I mean, I don't know, in your world, is it all non? Yeah. Okay. So I am saying in my world, it's more working for a company, and they're taking taxes out. So it could just make sure you're asking yeah. if you're really being charged taxes. You'll get one of two forms, a W-2, w -2 which means you're a... A, f a full time employee or a 1099, which may yeah. means we paid you this money, we didn't take anything out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, after. Another question. <laughs> we have a question over here. This is more of um, what would y'all have done in the situation? I had had a possible freelance uh, job for a local card store, and I was trying to, I kept going and bugging a worker to talk to the boss, and the boss. Uh, had been burned multiple times, so I was trying to get the job, but when I finally sat down and talked with him, he asked me some questions about, like, oh, could you get, like, say, a little watermark off a artwork, and he was saying some stuff that, to me, felt a little shady, so I just um, quit, I just quit making contact with him. Would y'all have done the same thing, or would you said, I'm sorry, 
some of the stuff you're asking for doesn't seem right. Right. Yeah. It's best to go separate there's, ways. There's no reason to point out that you don't think something somebody's asking for is right, in my opinion, because all you do is, you know, create an awkward situation with that person or who knows why they need it. Maybe they need it for a perfectly legitimate reason and you saying that kind of, you know, comes across as insulting or something. I would never I would never kind of judge the person on what they're asking me for. If I didn't want to do it or it didn't feel right to me, I would just say, oh, you know, I don't have any availability right now. I'm very busy. I can't take on too much work because I never want to uh, uh, compromise the creative quality. And that's always a great excuse if you don't want to do something like because, because look at how it positions Good. you. You're positioning yourself as too busy and too successful to handle it, not in an arrogant or way, but in, a, in, in the refusal to sacrifice the quality of your work. So let's say this person is legitimate and what they wanted you to do, they had a good reason for. Now they have a bigger project for you a year from now and they're going to think about you because you're a busy guy. You're, you're, yeah, you, you know, so that's how you handle something like that. It's all a game. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of questions. More in the back. Question over here. Hi, morning. Um, morning. My question to you is, what would your advice be for somebody who is international and is trying to transition as a freelancer here in the U.S.? I, do you have any answer? You know, I, I think part of, uh, to me, I, I work with artists all over the world. I mean, uh, we have uh, logo designers in London we work with all the time. We have uh, character designers in Spain, uh, people in Brazil. Uh, I think part of, uh, uh, it depends on what you want to freelance in, but you, you know, it sets you apart. Part of uh, being international is that you have a uh, uh, more worldly perspective on things. So one potential way to play that, depending on what you're creating and if it's appropriate and who you're handling or dealing with, is owning it and just being who you are and saying like, yeah, you know, I'm here uh, working in this market. Uh, I have worldly experience and, and I have a different point of view on things. At my studio, I love having different points of view. I don't want a, a room of all the same type of people. I want somebody that thinks about things differently because they're going to see an angle that we haven't thought of, you know. So uh, I think just own it and embrace it. It's not a hindrance at all. You know, make sure that the communication skills are uh, top notch. That's my only concern with working with somebody international. But if they can communicate to me and their portfolio is, is good, uh, that's all I care about. Question over here. Hi, I'm fielding questions from our uh, live stream viewers. So we have a few questions from people working um, remotely. And Dave Grenier asks, is it more difficult to be a freelancer remotely? Yeah, you know, I think it can be more difficult. Uh, I think, you know, I'm not sure, where are you guys? Can you wave so I see where I'm they're talking? talking to they're on, they're online. online. Oh, okay. Oh, from online. I was like... <laughs> yeah, they're online. Uh, so the, this inherently, the question is coming remotely. And no <laughs> but uh, no, you know, I think it is harder because here's what you have to do when you get that freelance gig and you're working remotely. Uh, you know, I'm the creative director of my studio, so I'm walking down the line and I'm seeing in the bullpen an artist who's spending two hours doing something that doesn't matter. I can stop them and I can sit with them and we could talk about critiquing it, how to fine tune it. The danger you run when you're uh, a newer freelancer and working remotely on top of it is you don't have the guidance of a senior art director there. So you could send in your work way later in the day and spend a lot of their time and money and be so off brand or so off base for what they're looking for. I can't tell you how many times when I first started freelancing, just getting up and going to get a cup of coffee or water, I would see somebody else's screen and it would make me think about what I was creating. Oh, I better be conscious of this. So uh, remote, freelance, new, that's, that's very difficult. It's possible, but my advice is to check in frequently with your uh, boss or, you know, uh, make sure that they're seeing your work in progress, depending on what industry you're in, and uh, stay connected because there's nothing worse than having somebody jam all day long, seeing it end of day, and it's way off base. I think a lot of it has to do with the industry that you're in. I, right. I do um, illustration. I'm working on a project right now for a client I've worked with regularly for 20 years. I know his kids. I send him birthday cards, and I've never seen him. Nope. I've never met him. Um, so, I know what he looks like because I know his uh, Facebook uh, picture. Yeah. But literally worked with him regularly for 20 years and never met. I, yep. I want to add.
hat on, and it really does matter what industry you're in. If sure. you're just doing print communication or if you're working on a startup company, if you have a thorough project brief, if you ask them the right questions and you put together a, a, a package saying, let me make sure this is what I'm understanding, and you write point by point by point what they're wanting for that particular project and you send it back to them, you are kind of gaining a little bit of, of knowledge because you're finding out, yes, this is exactly want the, what they want. And if you are not, if you write down something that is not what they want, they're going to be able to catch it at the beginning and tell you, no, that's not what I exactly meant. And then they'll correct you. So I think it's really important to ask a lot of questions if you're not there with them. I have clients that are in different areas in Florida, plus I have clients in Australia and on Ireland that I've never met as well, and I'm still working on projects for them, and I can still keep it on point because I've asked a thorough amount of questions each time I've come up with a new project for them, and it's been successful thus far. Definitely. Question over here. Hello. Hi. Okay, so I have a question. I was thinking of this like on the long run of freelancing. So I know that you guys uh, travel like to Sweden or like many different parts of the world. One question came into mind was this: Do you guys have like a home or like when you like? <laughs> no, oh. <laughs> we live at work. <laughs> okay, so like when you say you do go to like I don't know Europe or whatever, do you just like go to a motel or do you just like stay at the workplace? Because like when no. you're traveling from like many different places, you gotta like you know stay somewhere. You can't just like work at like your desk yeah sleep at your desk you know it's all part of the deal it's worked in, in my experience i i uh lived in new york for about uh six months and i was branding the nba finals there and uh, working on some designs for the first iron man movie and uh they put me up on the upper east side in a brownstone and you know so you get you get put up places everywhere i've been i've never had to stay on the street so that's good hopefully we'll, we'll keep hitting that goal uh so <laughs> If you're going to get an opportunity like that, you know, it is important to talk about your accommodations. You know, you don't want to be put up at some, like, nasty place where you're going to not get sleep and the next day you got to go into the studio and you can't perform and, and you can't think. Uh, so, like I said before, the pregame, before you take the booking, is so important. I, I took a three-month booking in Milan, Italy, and I was very concerned about, like, where I was going to be, uh, the quality of the place I was going to be in, and I asked them a lot of questions about it because I wanted to know that if I was going to live there for three months, I'd be comfortable. Um, so it's important to iron all that stuff out if you get an opportunity like that. And, and on the other side, I, I, I've definitely been sent out on jobs not quite as glamorous as his, but uh, definitely working, in, but I'm based in one place. Still lived in Los Angeles, got hired, would keep my apartment in Los Angeles. It usually wasn't long enough to rent it out, but there was one time where I was sent to Chicago for almost a year and so I did rent my apartment out and kept it and so I knew I could come back and it was still mine but I still had a place so try to save money on the other side if you can um, and or it's they're just gonna they're gonna pay for your travel or put you up if it's just a gig and you're going from city to city to city you'll always be sent and if you can avoid paying for your home base that's great but chances are you're gonna have an apartment somewhere and it's just it's a wash and you just hope the money it's so industry in. specific what? My student, my, it's so industry specific. My studio is 10 feet from my kitchen, and I never lo uh, leave Winter Park. So. <laughs> yep. It's all about the industry. We have a question over here. Okay, so um, freelancing seems like a pretty risky business, all with you know some clients not paying for um, their work. So, would like a good idea be to um, kind of establish a plan where you you do. Um, you do like half of the work and then you tell them to pay like half of the of what you're doing and then you know when you know that they're going to pay the full amount then that's when you finish it yes yeah, so it's you tricky you know it's tricky i think it's like anything here is industry dependent you know and it depends on what you're doing and and uh uh the one thing if you're working it sounds like more in, in kind of your world directly with the client and and kind of what i deal with now you have to realize that uh selling creative it, uh, you're selling something that uh, you know people have different opinions on and people have a different opinion of when it's done and and when that's delivered or when their money has been used uh, and so having clear uh, objectives 
and clear deliverables and a clear scope of work and a clear definition of expectations, uh, setting up the deal so you set yourself up and the client up for success in the beginning. That's so critical. Uh, I can't give specific advice on that because you're all in different programs and you know you can see here we have diversion just <laughs> on the same answers and slightly different nuances of the industry. But uh, the thing is, is in the beginning, you think through the deal and make sure that you, you really address all those things. And by the way, as a freelancer in television, I got paid weekly. Yeah. So I might have been on a three month job, but I was getting paid every week, yeah. even though it was freelance. Yeah. And if you're truly freelance, you're invoicing, if you're 1099 or whatever we're talking about, you're invoicing them whenever you're supposed to, but right. if you're put on as a freelancer but on staff, it's so weird, you're paid weekly anyway. Yeah. So it's My not. studio, we hire people on a day rate, and then uh, once they're there for uh, a certain period of time, they're paid every week, Yeah. and, and they just send us an invoice at the uh, end of every week. Yeah. So, so you well, can get paid weekly, potentially, it just depends. Well, you could, but if you're writing a proposal, you're writing down all of these stipulations of what is, what's deliverable from you, what they need to give you to get your work done on time, and you're also creating a project timeline. And on that timeline, there's dates for deliverables from them to you, you to them, plus you're also setting up a payment schedule in advance so they know when payments are going to need to be made at what point in the process. Yeah. So, and you're trying to stick to that schedule as closely as you possibly can. Sometimes the things come up and you can't, whether the client, and usually it's the client doesn't get you the information you need to get your work done. Nine out of 10 times is what happens. But you're sticking to that schedule and it's a professional relationship. So they know on those due dates, that's when you know. Yeah. Again, it and sounds it like it's very industry specific. Right, and don't let freelance be a dirty word either. Freelance can be great. I mean, yeah. freelance really is where I'm not, I think it's great. Sometimes they call you permalance. Have you ever heard that? Right. You're permanently freelance. It just means they're not giving you benefits, but you still have a job. Yeah, and just realize who you're applying with. If you're going to freelance at Sony Pictures or you're coming to freelance at my studio, you're not going to be giving us a scope of work and you're not going to be telling us what the schedule or when you'll get paid is going to happen. You know, Sony's going to tell you that. Uh, if like what she, you know, you're talking about is if you have a client where you're, you know, she's competing with other design firms out there, so she's treating that client just like my company or, or you know, uh, a larger company would treat it. So if you're going to freelance for a big company or if you're freelancing client direct, those are two different things where you see a lot of uh, it changes the answer a lot. So a lot of what we're speaking about, you know, if if you're going to the company, it's not going to be the same thing that you do if you're going client direct. True. It's confusing. We have a question over here. Okay. Being a show production major, uh, what do you see the importance of being backed by a union? Getting what? Backed being by backed a by a union. A union. Yeah. Uh, in my world, if you want to work at Fox and uh, if you want to work on the lot, you have to or else they won't book you. Um, otherwise, in my world, I don't really uh, see any point to do it. Uh, there's for motion graphics and animation, it's not like the film world or maybe the television I world. I think in show production, I think you being in the union probably matters. It's not my world either, but I can tell you all the crew and the guys who are setting up, they're all in the union. First of all, they get treated better. They get guaranteed breaks and things like that. If you're a producer, they can work you as long as they want with no, with no problem. So I think being in the union is a positive from my perspective, but I wasn't in a union. Yeah, good question. All right, we're gonna take our last question back over here. <laughs> Straight ahead. Hello, my name is Brian Gamble. I'm in music production. Um, my question is, say for instance, if you have a business already, if you have an LLC already, but um, the market that you want to actually work your business in is better to freelance than actually work in a business, would you, would you suggest just be a freelancer or just work the business if, if the market is even, even that big? Like say for, in, say for instance in Jacksonville, if the, the, the clientele for music production companies is like really, really small there. I think, to me, when you talk about LLC, that's just about how you get paid, right? I mean, that's what I'm thinking. It's not about, yeah. well, I'm not, I'm not sure, sure I understand the question. Liability yeah. too. Oh, liability. Yeah. I'm not sure I fully understand the question. I, I'm not sure I did either. Like, say, for instance, okay, I have my own company. Is it better to work it as a company or just be a freelance out of that company, if it makes sense? Um, you know, I don't, I think the thing is, uh, in the room, there's people from every different degree program. Uh, so I think it's so deal specific and industry specific. If it's something that you want to talk more in depth of details about, we could do that, you know, uh, afterwards or another time during the meet and greet or something. Um, but I'm not sure. 
uh, you know, I have a straight answer for you on that. And it's a good question. And just to say there are people who come from music production who do work, again, shameless plug, in career development who can probably give you a really direct answer on that degree specific yeah. answer. Um, I'm thinking of a few off the top of my head. So, sorry. Okay. Well, that's it. Thank you guys for attending. Thank you, guys. I want to... Um, Especially thank um, Laura and Nate and Risa for their uh, great comments and their knowledge and, and for spending all their time here today. So thank you very much.